Today's episode is brought to you by the Nuance Dragon Ambient Experience, or DAX for short. This is AI-powered ambient technology that helps physicians be more efficient and reduce clinical documentation burden. This is awesome technology. To learn more about how DAX Copilot can help reduce burnout and restore the joy of practicing medicine, ophthalmology, and other areas of medicine as well, visit nuance.com slash discover DAX. That's N-U-A-N-C-E dot com slash discover D-A-X. Hi. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Knock Knock I with Dr. Glockenflecken. That's me. I am your host uh, on today's journey into the world of eyeballs. That's what we do here. That's what we do on these episodes. We teach you about an eyeball thing that maybe you didn't know existed. Maybe you do know it exists, uh, but are just know nothing about it and want to learn more. Or maybe uh, your your phone froze up and it's stuck on this podcast. You can't do anything else but listen to me. I, whatever the reason, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, before we get to our topic today, it's Heart Month, February. We are right smack dab in the middle of February. It is Heart Month, a very special month in the Glock and Flecken household. Now, many of you are aware that I have a bit of a history with my heart. Uh, I, in, in 2020, May of 2020, I had a sudden cardiac arrest in my sleep. My wife, Kristen, Lady Glock and Flecken saved my life. And ever since then, uh, it's now been about four years. Uh, we uh, have tried to do, basically try to turn this terrible thing that happened in our lives into something good by doing advocacy work. Um, uh, you know, I talk about CPR and, and survivorship and Kristen, talks about co-survivorship because that's a, a, a big part of this whole thing. Everybody talks about CPR, doing chest compressions, and that is very important. Yes, you need to do chest compressions, but there's very little out there as far as support for the people who do those chest compressions because CPR is a traumatic thing to do to somebody, especially if you're not in medicine. If you have no medical background whatsoever, you're in a coffee shop or a movie theater or or on the sidewalk or wherever you are, and you have to do chest compressions, that's a hard thing to do. And so uh, Kristen has just done incredible work, award-winning work, uh, and just raising awareness, developing resources for uh, what she calls co-survivors of cardiac arrest, the people who help. And, uh, and I'm so freaking proud of, of just the work that she's done and, um, and just finding some good in the bad. And as part of Heart Month this year, we recently uh, took a trip to New York City to spend a few days with the American Heart Association. I was the plus one on this trip, by the way. This is all Kristen. She, she was the, the guest of honor. I was I was there just to to support her and um and uh, you know do a little advocacy myself but this was this was all her and um and there were other of uh, social media personalities there this was like a, a kind of a a big advocacy campaign kickoff for the beginning of Heart Month where we talked about CPR Dr Mike was there there are a bunch of other uh, uh, famous people that you probably met. Um, we definitely felt a little bit out of place, <laughs> but, but it was really an honor to, to be able to be included. And, uh, there was a, a, um, uh, see, what did we do? So first of all, this is our first, Kristen and I, our first trip to New York together. Fantastic city. Amazing. Uh, I, I, I've been once before, but I was in high school. It was a school trip and, um, uh, it just, it's it just massive. Massive city and 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 the the energy, uh, the the food we had we had our New York pizza, had a bagel, had had all the things you're supposed to have in New York. I didn't get a street hot dog. Little scared, little scared about that. I got to walk around uh, uh, Central Park. We I I filmed a video. I, if you go to my TikTok and YouTube channel, you'll you'll see a uh, um the the infectious disease specialist. Uh, visits New York City. <laughs> it's basically just me walking around uh, talking about rat-borne diseases. Uh, walking around. Uh, um, so if you were to to to, to walk uh, in 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 Central Park that day, you would have seen me talking to myself 
actually really talking to invisible children around me. Um, the things you do for content, folks. So we, into, uh, we walked around Central Park and uh, went to the, the top of the rock, Rockefeller Center, got a nice view of the, of, of, of the city. And, um, and also, and with the, those are the extra things we did, but with the American Heart Association, we had a, a wonderful, um, a, got a cocktail party where we got to meet and mingle with, with, uh, people in the American Heart Association and with other social media influencers. I hate that word. I really do. I guess that's what I, I, I just, the only thing I try to influence you to do is to send hate mail to your health insurance company. That's really the, 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 the small bit of influencing that I do. Um, and then uh, we, we, uh, had a, uh, a wonderful gala red dressed in red. Everybody's dressed in red. Uh, there were like, like legitimate celebrities that were there and, 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 um, uh, did this fashion show and, and just all raising awareness for uh, the, the heart disease, uh, particularly um, how heart disease affects women. Um, and it, it just a really fun, awesome environment to really kick off this month and get people talking about heart health, about CPR, about chest compressions, about cardiac arrest, uh, which is a, a big part of what we're trying to do here. And, uh, and then the last day we were there, this is very exciting. We got to visit TikTok headquarters in New York. Uh, as and and so my this is my first time in like a big tech environment building. You know, seeing what it's like. Very uh, uh, you know modern appearing. Uh, uh, got lots of cool features. Light up you know LED boards and 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 big TikTok logos and <laughs> it was uh, uh yeah I posted a video from inside there as well as the nephrologist uh, fighting with Heartman which was uh, one of the American Heart Association employees dressed up as a big heart um, and and we did a, a TikTok live uh, teaching people how to do chest compressions Dr Mike was leading the way. Uh, and, um, um, uh, we, <laughs> there was like a group of about 16 or 20 of us, like social media people. And so we all like took turns, uh, competing in this chest compression event using mannequins. And it was like, we were running in heats of four people and the winner of each heat went on to the next round. And the winner got like this big chest compression belt, like a championship, like wrestling belt, basically. Uh, and so in my heat, you'll be um, interested to know that I finished fourth out of four. I got crushed. I still think my mannequin was malfunctioning, like it wasn't registering my chest compressions because I did it. I've done chest. It's been a while, but uh, I do see the comedy in an ophthalmologist, like a, 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 a whole ass physician losing terribly in a game of chest compressions. So. Um, it was fun. It was, it was just all a good time. And just, we raised a bunch of awareness and money and, and it was, uh, um, just really, really, uh, a, 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 a something that I would never have gotten to do otherwise, if it wasn't for social media and my own stupid heart and, and, and then, uh, turning that into advocacy. And that's really what it's all about. You know, at the end of the day, when I look back on my life, my career, like what are the things that's gonna that are gonna stick out? And one of them is going to be the work that Kristen and I have done together, just trying to get people to understand the importance of chest compressions. The chance of an uh, survival after an out of hospital cardiac arrest, you guys, ten percent, ten percent chance of survival. If effective chest compressions are done, are started immediately, the chance of survival goes up about three and a half out of ten. It's about 35 percent that's an enormous improvement it may not still it may still not seem like a lot but that is a massive improvement in survival that's a lot of lives saved there are very few things if any in medicine that are free any interventions that are free that anybody who's physically able to do it can learn how to do it uh that have that impact on survival in chest compressions, hands only CPR is one of those things. So spread the word for Heart Month. 
tell your friends, tell your family. We all have people who that we know that don't know how to do CPR. They don't know anything about it. Those are the people you need to go up and hey, hey, do you know do you know about chest compression? Do you know about CPR? All right. It's and it's it's not you mean it, it helps to have a class, to take a class to do it. You should do that if you can. But if not, you know, the 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 it's it's two steps. It's it's one when you see someone go down, you don't have to you don't check a You just you check to see if they can if you can wake them up if they're if they're if they're uh, um you know if they're unconscious if they're if they're arousable, uh then um uh, you check that and then you have someone call for help call nine one one and then you start chest compressions, all right, hands right in the center of the chest kind of right in the mid like right in the nipple line here push hard and fast, staying alive. You know, that's the, that's the, uh, the speed of that song and, um, um, hard and fast push on the chest until help arrives. You're just buying time. That's what you're doing. You're buying time for that person until paramedics can arrive until a physician or whoever it is can arrive that has that expertise to do additional life-saving measures. So chest compressions, heart month. Thank you all for indulging me on that. Great time in New York, though. It really was a lot of fun. Let's take a quick break, and we'll come back with our topic of the day. All right, we are back. You know what? In honor of Heart Month, I figured that I would choose a topic today that is uh, somewhat related to the heart. Now, as an ophthalmologist, there's just a few things that overlap with the heart. All right. I like that. I don't, I don't know as much about the heart these days as I used to. I know that it supplies blood to the eye, which is very important. The eye needs blood. Um, but I, I so I'm not going to get it too far out over my skis here in talking about the heart, but there are a few things that we can discuss. One of them we're going to talk about is blood clots. Specifically, blood clots to the eye. That's right. I'm going to talk to you guys about central retinal artery occlusions. And another version of it, branch retinal artery occlusions. All right. So this is what we're doing. Hope you enjoy this. <laughs> so um, this is in honor of Heart Month. All right. So uh, uh, central retinal artery occlusion. You know, one thing that. Um, is that gets a lot of attention is is stroke we talked about that a lot actually with the american heart association that's one of their big emphasis uh, points of emphasis is uh, you know the signs of stroke and because that has you know, obviously has to do with blood flow um, but uh, an ischemic stroke can be caused by a blood clot in fact it often is caused by a blood clot well you can think of the eye as an extension of the brain. Some might refer to them as brain bubbles. Not me. Well, occasionally I'll do that. But, it, it, but the eyes are an extension of the brain. The, the retina, the optic nerve, it's, all, it's nerve tissue, right? So it's right there. So if you can get a clot to the brain, you can get a clot to the eye. And it is a stroke. A lot of people are like, central retinal artery occlusion is a separate thing from a stroke. It's really not. It's just a stroke in a different structure uh, but it still affects neuro, nerve tissue. So we treat it like a stroke. Uh, so your classic presentation of a central retinal artery occlusion would be um, a patient who comes in after uh, so many, you know, X number of hours, we'll say like they come in, you know, four hours after uh, developing sudden massive vision loss. So their vision in one eye just went out. Either got, uh, you know, it totally went out where there's no light perception, but more likely it, he lost vision to where they can only see maybe their hand in front of their face, or they just see light in front of them. That is massive. That is severe vision loss. Now, as opposed to a lot of the pants patients that we talked about a couple of months ago, like open globe injuries, chemical injuries, uh, um, uh, angle closure, glaucoma, those all cause painful vision loss. Painless vision loss is maybe kind of more like a subacute emergency, right? Those patients do need to be seen within, 
within a few hours if you can. But it's not like an emergency of emergencies because a lot of times you're not, there's, there's not a lot to do emergently. So let's talk about exactly what this is and what's going on with the patient. So the eye, the back of the eye, the retina, the optic nerve, it all has vasculature, right? You got to have blood flow to the eye. Well, you have lots of blood vessels. The main one is the ophthalmic artery. All right, so the ophthalmic artery, it comes off of the big neck artery, the carotid. All right, the carotid, one of the branches of the carotid artery. Right here, when you feel your pulse in your neck, that's your carotid artery. So the ophthalmic artery comes off of the carotid artery. It's a branch, a big branch of the carotid artery. And that starts going to your eye. And so all the blood that, that supplies your eye, it originates from the carotid and then also from the ophthalmic artery. And then as the ophthalmic artery gets into the orbit, which is the space behind the eye, it branches again into the central retinal artery. All right, so the central retinal artery comes off of the ophthalmic artery. And that artery, that central retinal artery, is what supplies all of the retina. All right, the inner retina. When you look at the back of the eyeball, you see all these beautiful blood vessels. The central retinal artery supplies most of those blood vessels. So if you get a blood clot that starts, we'll say, in the neck or in the heart, it breaks off. It starts to travel up. It gets into the ophthalmic artery. It goes into the orbit and it finds a way to kind of get up into the central retinal artery. It's small enough. Then it can block that artery. And by virtue of blocking that artery, it blocks blood flow to the retina. And if you don't have blood flow to the retina, there goes your vision. Because you need the retina in order to see. That's where your photoreceptors are. So people with a central retinal artery occlusion will have a blood clot that basically takes out the blood flow to the important part of the, the retina, which is the macula, that center part where all the density of the photoreceptors are. It just takes those out. They stop working because they have no blood flow. And of course, the vision just drops. Patients will still have a little bit of vision, right? but they don't have any acuity. Again, just like blotches, they'll see, just you may, may see their hand, they may see light, that's about it. And so a question I usually get at this point is, what do we do about that? Well, first let's talk about the different etiologies of this. So atherosclerosis is is the underlying mechanism for a lot of this stuff. Just like you can get, just like a stroke, you know, heart disease, atherosclerosis, you get clots in the arteries. They can break off. They can go to the eye. So you get an embolus. All right, a lot of the, most of the time, the embolus is cholesterol. You know, just cholesterol builds up in your arteries. That's why doctors are talking to control your cholesterol, control your heart health. Heart health is so important. AHA, that's heart health. Everything's heart health. Because with a central and artery occlusion, you can get a piece of cholesterol, it breaks off, goes to the eye. There's other forms of emboli as well. There's platelets. You can get a little platelet, you know, fibrin clot. Uh, you can get a little piece of like a heart tumor, which, is, which would be much more rare. Uh, you can also have other things besides, I, I would say emboli are the most, that's the most common cause of a clot to the central retinal artery. But you can have a vasculitis. You can just have inflammation of the nerves that blocks off blood flow, like giant cell arteritis. We've talked about giant cell arteritis on this podcast. Happens in elderly patients. That's why we always, anytime central retinal artery uh, uh, occlusion comes up, we always check the ESR. We always check labs because even though giant cell arteritis is rare, it's something you don't want to miss because it's treatable. So vasculitis. Uh, trauma, of course, you can can obstruct, you can uh, you know, um, take out blood flow to the to the back of the eye. Uh, patients with clotting disorders, uh, you know, any kind of, of autoimmune clotting problem. Uh, there's you know antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, hyperhomocystinuria, um, uh, platelet abnormalities, uh, it, it, all kinds of stuff. There's there's a, a huge list of different clotting problems. Uh, patients who, who are taking oral contraceptives, uh, who also smoke, like that's, that's a big one there. 
uh, pregnancy. You can get a little bit hypercoagulable with pregnancy. Sickle cell disease. So the list goes on and on. So some kind of coagulopathy is what we call that. Those are probably the big ones, there's, but there's, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, I'd say clots are the most common. And when a patient comes in, like this patient that I mentioned earlier, comes in with hand motion vision, um, what I'll see on exam is I'll look at the back of the eye. Well, first of all, I'll do a pupil exam, and you will usually see a, a big relative afferent pupillary defect. It's just, it's the, it's a, it's a, the, basically a swinging flashlight test that tells me if it's abnormal on one side, then I know, oh, that optic nerve is not working. The nervous, the neural tissue in the back of the eye is not functioning properly. That's why there's an RAPD gives me a clue. Oh, this could be something like a central retinal artery occlusion. And then I'll look back there and I see that the retina which is normally kind of an orangish, reddish hue to it. Depending on how darkly pigmented the retina is, it can be a little bit more of a brownish color. Um, um, it will look white because it has no blood flow. Just like you can look, if you just if you see a ghost, all right, dra the, the blood drains from your face, you look white like a sheet, like that, it's because there's no blood there. Well, if you lose blood flow to the central retinal artery, the retina is going to look white because it has no blood, right? So that you're going to see this big all swollen retina. They call it a, a, a cherry red spot because right in the center, you don't have the retina tissue to swell. So it just looks red right there in the center. But the, the retina generally is very white. So what do we do about it? Because this is terrible. This is one of my least favorite things to have to tell a patient is that they have had a central retinal artery occlusion because for the most part, it's irreversible damage. With an ischemic stroke, there's always the question, when did this happen? Are they within a window, a, a time frame where you can do, um, uh, uh, you can give a clot busting medication to, to relieve the blockage? And there have been some case reports, some case studies looking at giving like intra-arterial anticoagulation medicine like that, but there's nothing that has really shown vision recovery. With a stroke, there's a certain time frame. You have to give those clot-busting medications within like, I'm not, uh, don't quote me on this because that's not my area of expertise, but something like 90 minutes. It's got to it's be relatively soon because the tissue then starts dying. Well, to this day, and I've seen a lot of central retinal artery occlusions, I have not seen someone come in for this problem within that time frame. Because it, it's a little bit different than a stroke. People, it, it's very, it, it's, it's more in the public consciousness, the signs of a stroke, slurred speech, weakness. There's like, there's public health campaigns that surround the signs of a stroke. With eye stuff, I don't know what it is. It, it's because you feel normal. You're, the rest of your body feels good. You just you lose an eye. You, I mean, so you don't lose an eye. You lose vision in one eye. There's a lot of people who just, oh, let me just see. Maybe it'll, it'll go away. It'll get better on its own. I hear that a lot. And sure, and before long, it's you know, three, four hours. And the vision hasn't come back. Like, something's really wrong. Let me go in to see the doctor. So, so it's very rare that we get someone that comes in right away, lost vision 10 minutes ago, you know, they go into the emergency room or they come into the, or they walk into the clinic or whatever it is. So, uh, so the, 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 the decision of like to do some kind of intra arterial clot busting medicine th th we don't, that doesn't come up in our world. So most of the time when we're seeing this, we are giving the diagnosis and breaking bad news to people that your vision is never going to be normal out of this eye. Now, can it improve? It can improve a little bit, very, like very little. We're not talking going from hand motion vision, all of a sudden to be able to read 2020 again. No, no, not even, not anywhere close. The vision is, is generally 
pretty poor, maybe like 10% vision recovery. Um, there are certain vascular anomalies where people can have like two vessels that come off of the ophthalmic artery. These are very lucky people, by the way, it's called a cilioretinal artery where they'll have like an extra little artery that comes off and supplies the retina and, and, and there's no clot in that artery. So they have a preserved area of their retina that still works. These are very lucky. It's, it's about 20, 25% of the population that has one of these aberrant, you know, arterial variants. Um, but most people don't have that. And, and so it's, um, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. And, and it's, it takes several visits. You know, I keep, I, when I see this, I have people come back, you know, every few weeks for a little while. And because sometimes you, you need to process this, you need to, but, but I have a lot of patients that have one eye. A lot of people have one eye and they can function normally. You can drive a car with one eye. You can do, you might be able, you might not be able to like fly a commercial jet with one eye. Uh, probably not in fact, but it, it, it doesn't limit you in for your in like daily life. Like you can, um, people can accommodate. People are resilient, and and um, and you can you can still get a lot, do a lot with just one eye. So these are these are the conversations that I have with people who are are coming to terms with the idea that they've they've lost functional vision in one eye. The other big part of treatment, even though, and I never tell people, I've never once told someone there's nothing we can do for you because there, there is always something you can do for somebody. Even if there's no medical treatment for what is going on with that patient, there's always something you can do as a physician. You can always provide counseling. You can always be there to just listen to the concerns they're having, how this has affected their life. Maybe they can go talk to somebody. Maybe you know somebody that they can talk to. It doesn't do any good to say, there's nothing I can do for you because it's not true. It's not true. There may be no medical treatment that you can do for them, but that's very different from just saying, there's nothing I can do. You can be there. You can listen. You can you, you, you be a medical professional and, and, just, and just give support. In the case of, of this disease, central retinal artery occlusions, one thing we can do is try to keep it from happening again. So that clot came from somewhere, right? We have to assume, even if I can't see a clot, sometimes we can see the clot in the back of the eye, like, oh, there's the, there's the blood vessel, there's the clot. Sometimes we can see it. Um, a lot of times we can't. We don't know where it is, just that it's there. Uh, and so we can send that patient for testing to try to make sure we find a source for that clot, whether it's in the heart or in the artery, in the neck arteries, the carotid arteries. So we'll do a carotid ultrasound, a cardiac echo. Uh, we'll also check for some of these um, coagulopathies or giant cell arteritis. We'll send some lab tests, ESR, CRP. These are inflammatory markers. Uh, looking for any potential cause that we're not thinking of. That's what you can do. That's what I do. And, um, and so our, my goal with the central retinal artery occlusion is make sure that I, I, I guide the patient to understand and adapt to their new vision while also doing what I can to try to keep this from happening again, because if a clot can go to the eye, it can go to the brain and cause even more problems than they already have. So. That's the rundown of central retinal artery occlusions. Now, I mentioned branch retinal artery occlusions. Well, a central, a central retinal artery, that's the main artery, right? That's, you don't want to clot there, obviously. A branch retinal artery occlusion is just like a downstream blood vessel from the central retinal artery. So it'll still take out a part of the retina, but it's not as devastating a vision loss. Usually, they got pretty good central vision. It's just like a part of their peripheral vision is not functioning. but it's still a clot. It just didn't affect a, it affected a smaller artery, arterial. So uh, we still treat it the same way, whether it's a central retinal artery occlusion or a branch retinal artery occlusion, it's still a stroke in our book. So we still will send that patient for a stroke workup, do all the things, all the imaging, look for a source, all that stuff. Um, 
so that's it. That's it for central art and arteries. Um, I'll see. I got uh, a little bit of time here. Let me do. Uh, how about a, a little message? I got, I got an email. This is great. This is from a, a listener named Kim, uh, who said that uh, I should uh, mention or I asked if I had if I had heard about mantis shrimp and their remarkable eyeballs. I wouldn't you call it eyeballs? They're probably not really balls. They're eye structures. <laughs> so Kim wanted me to just uh, talk a bit about uh, mantis eyes. I actually, I had heard that something was weird, but I didn't remember. So I actually uh, looked it up. I'm on this website, fizz.org. Cool website, actually. And, uh, <laughs> and they, they talk about mantis eyes. So normally, you know, I talked before about um, human photoreceptors, like we have red photoreceptors. These are rods and cones, right? We have red, green, blue. That gives us all the spectrum of colors. Well, um, uh, mantis shrimp are are a little bit different. They have, we have three different types of photoreceptors. Mantis shrimp have 16 photoreceptors, you guys. 16. They can see ultraviolet light. They can see visible, like our color spectrum. They can see polarized light. They, uh, they can, they can do, they see things with light that we can't even comprehend. I don't know how that, that they survive that way. Like what, I don't, I don't even know what they're seeing, but the 16 photoreceptors, they have these compound eyes that made up of, of just tens of thousands of these photoreceptor cells, but there's 16 different types of them, which allows them to see if, if our if our our three photoreceptor cells allows allow us to see wavelength and just the visible spectrum, which is like I don't know four hundred to seven hundred nanometer wavelength of light, like the sixteen photoreceptors that they have just expand that into all these different spectrums. So it's that's it's remarkable. I'm not sure what that helps them do, uh, but they got excellent ultraviolet vision. What what good is that? I, I I don't know. Someone who's a mantis shrimp expert, please reach out. I would love to hear more about this. Maybe I'll have to do a little bit more research. I just did a little bit of research here, just to see what I said, so I can sound what I know what I'm talking about. But I am not a mantis shrimp expert. Um. All right, that's it. Oh, I didn't do a don't do that eyeball tip of the week. I don't. I guess my big eyeball tip of the week is just don't ignore like massive vision loss in one or both eyes like i know it sounds silly like of course people are going to you're going to freak out if you lose vision in one eye you'd be surprised maybe it's just like people have like an optimistic outlook on life they feel like oh it's probably going to get better i hear that so much i thought it would get better so if you lose vision in one eye like call somebody about it all right so it's, it's it's usually a pretty serious problem, especially like if you like literally lose vision, like your vision blacks out, like it's not supposed to do that. Check each eye separately. Make sure it's you actually did lose vision, but uh, let, let people know about that. Your doctor, let somebody know. All right. Go to the emergency room if you have to. That's that can be a big deal. All right. Well, thank you all for listening. And uh, thank you for indulging me about heart month uh, again. You know, big deal. Um, chest compressions save lives. So, so get out there, spread the word, tell your friends, tell your family. Thank you all for listening and give me your, your, um, your topics. All right. Uh, come on. I want to, I want to, uh, let's see what's going to be next. I was, I was co- compiling a list of things. I have to look at it. I don't remember which, uh, which one I'm doing next, but I'm enjoying this. This is great. Listening to myself talk for like 30 minutes at a time. Thank you for listening. I am your host, Will Flannery, also known as Dr. Glockenfleck. And special thanks to my producers. Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, and Sean T. Brooke. Our editor and engineer is Jason Portizo. Music is by Omer, Omer Binsby. Knock Knock High is a human content production. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.